Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another Lapco Fitness Podcast. Your host, Yab Muhammad, and today I have with me, as usual, Joshua Nademan. What's up? That's your cue. <laughs> it's me. I, How's it going, everybody? It's good to be back for another podcast. Yeah, they have a bunch of questions, Josh. Twelve yeah, tell to me be about exact. what we got. Well, Twelve you want to dive? Yeah, you want to dive in into what they have Let's, to say? Let's do it. Our curious audience. Well, first yeah. off, Abdul Ghani Mamon. He says, and this is not related to fitness. Well, it is. We're not our kind of fitness. He has says, what are some good ways to train to improve performance in basketball? For example, to be able to stop on a dime, beat an opponent off in the dribble, and have mm-hmm. a quick first step, etc. Whoa! Uh, well, quiz- so quick first step is actually the hardest thing, so we're not going to talk about that. Um, the easiest thing is stopping and changing directions. There's two aspects to it. There is one, do you have the technique that you need? In other words, are you trying to stop in one step, or do you understand stutter stepping? And are you able to track your opponent properly? Those are skill-based things. And -hmm. your quadriceps really are the muscles that will allow you to stop on a dime. They're also the same muscles that allow you to convert forward motion into upwards motion. So they're a big part of being able to jump on a basketball court, which is totally different than the standing jump people typically measure vertical leap by. So that's... uh... (laughs) Yeah, it's a different kind of question. Technically, anything that you would do for your quadriceps would help. But in isolation, uh, exercise is only going to do so much. So without really seeing a video of what this guy's or girl's problem is, I'm not going to be able to help them very much. But as a general rule, you want to go through your single leg and double leg squat progressions. You want to make sure that uh, if you have relatively weak quadriceps and you find yourself having uh, to rely more on the hips rising before the shoulders rising kind of thing to turn it into a deadlift because your posterior chain is dominant, then you're going to have to spend extra time on your quads. And that may mean that you actually don't do as much squatting as you do leg extensions, certain setups of leg press that allow for more quad than ham work um, because leg press is a little different than squat. And um, I really should have said more glute, but... It's all kind of tied together on the leg press. And when you are trying to stop, that's really what it is. You think about what you're doing. You're running forward. If you're running backwards and you pull a sled backwards, like you're facing this way, but I'm pulling the sled this way, your quads are going to tire out really quick. So depending on what you have, there are a lot of different ways to work those muscles. But the bottom line is that if you don't build quadricep strength, um, you're not going to do a very good job. And when it comes to changing directions, if you don't have good technique, learn how to stay stiff and pivot around the center of mass instead of bending and wobbling, you're always going to get beat. So, and then quick step is a quick step. You're either twitchy or you're not. Yes, you can improve speed. Yes, you can become more efficient. Uh, and yes, it's boring. You have to That's the really... power cycle thing, right? What's that? It... They know that they have to do a power cycle we talked about. So that'll be part of what makes them better. Yeah, for sure. Uh, But a lot of it is that they have unnecessary movements. So it's less of a pure strength training thing and more of, do you have somebody who can watch you and actually see where you're losing power, see where you are losing your timing? And um, the truth, and, and, and is there somebody who can watch you and say, listen, you're just not as fast as them. Um, because sometimes that's true. You know, we don't want to hear that. We want to think we can fix everything. And yeah. we can't. We can improve everything. But, you know, if you can go from, you know, 20 to 75 and somebody else was born at 50, guess what? <laughs> they can get to 100. And with less work yeah. than it takes for you to get to 75. And um, that's, that's an unfortunate truth in life. Um, so you just got to take it step by step. Make sure that you're not bending and wobbling. Make sure that you're giving yourself good quadricep strength. Uh, make sure that you are practicing slowly so that you can identify where you have issues. And make sure that you are steadily increasing it to full play speed without hurting yourself. So there's a lot that goes into that. I mean, that's a harder question to answer just with words. 
yeah than it is getting onto a court because in like five minutes you can identify every single problem essentially and say all right now we're going to make a game plan for every one of these and in a couple of months you'll be a different player you know but oh. all right yeah. let's move on to the next question then uh this one is actually i find very interesting it's by alija hunsaker he says, mm-hmm. will frequent or even daily use of anti-inflammatory medication or antihistamines have negative effect on my training? Ah, antihistamines, That's... no. Okay, okay. What about um, the NSAIDs? Above or... 400 to 600 milligrams, there is a negative effect. 200 uh, in studies done on young men shows really all the way up the 200 and the 400 doses for sure really didn't have any uh, differences versus controls. Mm-hmm. 800 has a noticeable negative impact. So the recommendation is to stay at or below 600 if you are lifting heavy. And so the better question is, why the hell are you asking this? <laughs> What's going on that you need insets every day? Because that's a problem. Um, it tells me that uh, something happened. Uh, or is happening uh, that probably shouldn't be. And uh, I'd be concerned about that. You know, you're putting your kidneys at risk. You're putting your stomach at risk. If you're taking long-term NSAIDs, which you shouldn't be, then you need to have uh, stomach protection as well. You you know, so this is, this is one of those cases of it just turns into uh, lots of medications covering side effects, wasting your money and um, putting you at risk for things you don't need to be at risk of. And uh, the the better solution, if it's a possible solution, is to say, why am I hurting? Yeah. I, I, you know, and, I and fix that. I hope he's doing that under guidance of a doctor. You would, you, uh, you would hope, but, you know, it's funny. Like, uh, And you have to be careful what you ask people, too, because I've had plenty of patients come in, and they'll say, you know, you ask them, hey, do you use, like, Tylenol or aspirin or Motrin or any of these things, and you're like, nah, man. And then you're like, okay, so, you know, like, what do you do for your pain? Like, man, I got these BC powders. Dude, it's not, it's like 845 milligrams of aspirin. Holy shit. I mean, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, and, and it's not there. It's not that they're stupid. It's that they're, they're literally word for word answering the questions that I'm asking because they don't know what I'm trying to get at. So, um, well, it's your yeah. job as a doctor to get that out of them, you know? Yeah. 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 And it's tricky. You know, you gotta, there's a it's lot of, tricky. you, you got to keep your wits about you and, uh, you know, understand that you're, you're trying to figure things out and people are not trying to hide them from you typically. No, you just, yeah, no, no, you're right. They that's, just don't speak your language. That's a big part of the job. Well, let's move on to the next question by Richard Welling. Yeah. He says, hey, guys. Oh, this is actually a pretty long question. I think it's so long, we didn't even register most of it. Okay. Uh, so hmm. I'm just going to read the first two paragraphs because the third one stopped. The first two paragraphs. Okay. Right. Hey, guys, just joined, but there are currently no slots open for the lap. Some quick background. I've been lifting, rock climbing, or doing calisthenics in some combination for the last eight years. I have a few skills, such as a one arm chin-up. Nice. 90-degree push-up. Very nice. A uh, shrill planche. Great. Mm-hmm. And the front lever. This guy is a beast. So he's pretty strong. He's pretty he's strong. I'm wanting mm-hmm. to break my current plateau and get the full planche. Well, we've all been there. So I'm looking to start on periodization, but I want to know how long I should spend on each chunk. Also, for the mass phase, do you prefer a PPL-style routine or full body routines? Okay, so wait, wait. Before you go in, Josh, this is a guy mm-hmm. in a $5 group. Uh, what? Yeah, so he's not... So if to answer your question, you would actually have... We would... That's what the lab is. That's literally what the lab is. So we, we, we can't answer that question just like that. You would have to, um, you would have to upgrade because we have all of that, this answered in the lab. That's the whole yeah. purpose of the lab. I mean, if you want a generic answer, look at any and all reputable periodization books and you will see timelines that you can throw your training into. Um, you know, I have opinions about that. We have specific programming. Uh, and there's also a lot that goes into more than just, uh, you know, whether or not you do a full body or 
some sort of split. It goes into, there, there's a lot of factors that go in and you have to set your body up. You know, there's a sequence you need to do things in. Yeah. Um, no, you but, always want to try it, and get a little bigger before you get a little stronger. You know, you got to build capacity. <clears throat> and the, the key is to find a place that knows how to guide you through that safely. And that's what we have the lab for. Yeah, he wants to be part of the lab. We just don't have slots now, but they're gonna right, right. soon. Soon we'll have slots for you, and uh, we will answer all of your questions there. We no. cannot see, cannot wait to see you there because mm -hmm. you're a strong dude, and we can't wait to see what you achieve. Yeah, well, and the, uh, and the big thing is that you know, the way we have things set up, you're gonna you're gonna be working on the things that you're working on and maintaining all the strength that you have. You're yeah. not gonna be going backwards. We're gonna be making steps for you to go forwards and. You'll be learning some stuff. Um, and the, the roadblock right now is that there's a new revision of uh, the, the, the lab, lab coming out. And so we want to make sure that gets properly tested before we bring new people in. <coughs> yeah, so which be a shouldn't bit take patient. too long. So be a little bit patient and uh, yeah. we will uh, just stay, stay, check out the social media and check the emails. Mm -hmm. We will keep you updated on the matter. Yeah, and I hate saying that because it does sound kind of douchey. I... But like, you know, it's, it's just... It is what it is, you know. We you don't want to be fair to all wanna... the people on the inside, you know. If exactly. I was paying, I would say, why are you going to give all the good stuff away for free to somebody who's asking, you know, just because you want to be a good dude when I'm sitting here supporting you? But even if you wanted to, we couldn't. We couldn't do that in a podcast. That's why we have the yeah. lab. We, we, it's just it's too much. It's I too mean, much. That's, yeah, when you see the amount of stuff that's available in the lab, it's a it's huge, huge, huge leap up from what's available to the five dollar group. Yeah. And um, it makes well, anyway, a huge difference. Just stay stay tuned for that. We'll move on to the next question uh, by John Galvin. Uh, and he, mm -hmm. he says, Hi, I really like the protein doses article, but I have a question. Mm -hmm. What happens if we take a whey shake and immediately after we eat a solid meal like chicken with veggies? Do we absorb mm -hmm. the whey protein first and then slowly mm -hmm. digest the chicken protein? If not, what if we wait like 30, 45 minutes between shake and the solid meal? I have the same question, too, about whey and casein mix. Thanks, guys. Yeah, I think those are great questions. Um, liquid portions of a meal drain out faster than solid portions. So the way you want to think about this is, like, if you had a whey shake and mashed potatoes, they're all going to kind of mix together into a sludge in your stomach and kind of exit at a fairly similar rate. But the chicken doesn't dissolve. Uh, you know, most of your veggies, they don't really dissolve. So... Some of the whey is going to stick around with them, but most of it is going to slip out of the um, pyloric sphincter into your intestines before the chicken does. Uh, so you're basically sort of front-loading things and speeding up the uh, protein synthesis process, and then you're basically uh, supporting it with the uh, sort of timed release of the chicken. Uh, white meat chicken gets digested very quickly. So, you know, the whey will get out and probably be uh, sustaining things for about an hour and a half, and that chicken will probably add another, like, three hours to that. So it's, you know, that's, that's a very reasonable way of getting a very similar, excuse me, effect to, like, <clears throat> what we get out of the whey, uh, the whey casein shake mixes. Um, but again, I would I would caution you against trying to be overly scientific with this. Yeah. It's an easy way to really get lost in details that don't matter so much. A lot of um, headaches, too. Yeah, yeah. The, the biggest thing is that uh, you just want to remember that solid food empties out more slowly than liquid food. And so if you're getting, uh, you know, if you want to hit a certain protein dose and you're doing half of it with solid food, do the other half with the liquid and don't worry about it. It's not going to matter that much whether it's whey or casein. Um, there are differences. There are, you know, all things being equal, it is nice to have a good bit of whey in the mix. Um, there are some protein fractions that are not in casein. So there's a, there's a lot for that in terms of non-exercise related things like immune support and potentially yeah. weight loss and things like that. Whey does have some uh, consistently demonstrated beneficial effects that a lot of other protein sources don't have. Um, and they're not bad. It just means that there's a little bit of extra good stuff in whey, as far as we can tell. So the short answer is don't worry about it. Yeah. yeah. 
I always mix a, uh, casing away in every shake. And then yeah, in the, I in do the evenings, too. I do uh, a lot more casing compared to the other shakes. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and then at night, just uh, either have a little bit of whey and a lot of casein or just have nothing but casein. Yeah. I mean... That's, that's how I do it. Mm -hmm. All right, next question. By Rigo Lass. He says, there's a yearly competition. I'm thinking of participating sometime in the future. The okay. rules are you do five exercises for the most reps. Whoever gets mm -hmm. the most total reps wins. The exercises are dips, pull-ups, bench with your body weight, squat with a one and a half body weight added, and deadlift with 1.8 body weight added. How would you structure your training throughout the year to get the most reps in all the exercises? And how would you approach this competition generally? Thank you. <laughs> You're asking for personal training. Yeah. <laughs> you I don't blame is. you. I don't blame is. you. Mm. Let's see. I'm thinking about how I want to answer that. Um, I'm going to take it piece by piece on a broad scale. Yeah. I would be uh I would be focused on body weight control, like literally not getting too heavy. Um okay. all things being equal. Well, three of those exercises are upper body, right? So it doesn't really make sense to develop massive, massive legs and then have to pull all that around with your uh, with your upper body. You know, it's going to drop I mean, your reps down. I mean, one down. of them is... Oh, yeah, wait, wait. The bench is with your body weight. So if your body weight increases... Okay. It doesn't sense. matter. It's still upper body. Yeah, yeah. 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 And so then if you get heavy, the heavier you get, the harder the bench gets. The heavier you get, the harder the dips get. The heavier you get, the harder the pull-ups get. Um, so upper body mass doesn't really uh, hurt you in that because that's what moves you. Um, you would want to be very specific. You, you really wouldn't want to do any accessory exercises that are not necessary for your health. And um, you would, you would want to be fairly specific uh, because you have a fairly specific goal. That's because you're not looking to be the strongest. You're not looking to be the fastest. You are looking for endurance at a particular workload. Um, and that, you also need to know what time of the year is it. Uh, is it winter or is it summer? If it's summer, you need to go through a two-week heat acclimatization unless it's in a climate-controlled environment. Otherwise, like at minimum, otherwise you're, you're going to overheat and massively underperform what you end up doing in the gym. Uh, there's a lot that goes into that. You need to be super well hydrated uh, when you start this. We need to know what the rest times are. Are you going straight from exercise to exercise? Is there an hour between each exercise? Like, there's a lot that goes into that. Um, How much can you rest between reps? Well, yeah, like, like I don't know. I don't actually know the, the specifics of the rules. Yeah, we, yeah. we have the general outline. But because we know that there's a squat and a deadlift, um, you know, oh, yeah. we, would, we would be tailoring form specifically for that competition to the absolute minimum standard necessary to count the reps. Uh, competition is not about health. It's about gold medals. And yeah. that is something that people just don't understand. Training for a competition is about staying as healthy as you can for as long as you can. Uh, but there is some inherent uh, dangers in doing that because you're looking to push your limits. So um, I would be... You, you have to build your strength up. You have to gain the size that you need, but not the size that you don't need, which means careful exercise selection. And you just need to be honest about your chances. If you're just doing it for fun, you have a lot more leeway. If you're trying to win, then uh, <laughs> we would have to strategize. I would need to measure you How bad you do out. you want to win? <laughs> I don't even care how bad you want to win. I want to know uh, whether or not you're inherently capable of it. And um, there's a lot of those determinations that can be made just uh, measuring people out. That's not something anybody wants to hear. But, you know, if you've got short arms and long legs, then, and uh, you, for whatever reason, for your size, you tend to be relatively weak in the squat, then, um, you know, you've got to you got to play to your strengths. Is this a total reps? Is it if I win three out of five yeah, exercises, I win? Yeah, nah, so I you think just it's need most to total reps. Yeah. 
Oh, but that's, that's, a, yeah, that's a good that, point. That's actually. a weird competition. I mean, I used to do I know, 93 yeah. dips. Exactly. I, mean, I, I would uh, in a row. I would I would just I would destroy the dips and pull ups, and then yeah. I wouldn't even worry about the rest. <laughs> yeah, it's like uh, you. I would say that your pull ups are your lowest priority, um, because and and you're going to lose to smaller people. The the champs are going to be small people, especially Sorry. if people who are gifted get in there. <laughs> Uh, it's just the way that it is. They're going to have short legs. They're probably going to have like medium to short arms. They're going to have abnormally thick chests front to back, not necessarily wide. And uh, so they're they're going to have immense uh, inherent advantages over people who are uh, built differently, you know. And you may not see them there because they don't care. But if we took everybody in the world and figured out who would be best at a competition like that, then it's it's going to be somebody with extremely small joints and uh, particular leverages. You know, there's there's a lot that goes into it, both in what you can see and what you can't. So uh, we can make predictions, and then we have to see how you do in training. That's a hard one. Yeah. Yeah. All right, let's move yeah, on. But I, but I would I would go after. Uh, I would definitely say that your dips are probably your opportunity to potentially gain the most total reps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and your bench. Um, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, it's a body weight bench. It, it well, and it also depends. Like, if you have to, if you, if your count stops uh, as soon as you stop moving, then um, you know, it's like, are you allowed to rest pause if you still hang on to the bar? I mean, oh. these questions, these questions matter. These That's questions why I'm matter. saying. Matter. Yeah. 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 Like, I, there's there are things I need to know, but um, that's a tough. Until one. then, it, we need to move on. Yeah. Sorry. Next question by Alex F. He says, would someone with mild injuries typical from bodyweight training, such as costochondritis, be suitable to do the program? If it was possible, how should we have be implemented into the program? Yeah, I mean, you do what you can do. Yeah, that's... Uh, I mean, I understand where the question's coming from. You know, the, the real question is whether or not you have the patience to let your injuries heal. Um, yeah. the way that I would be approaching it is, is honestly, you need to figure out exercises that let you build muscle mass without aggravating your injury. And you may need to kind of let your chest fall behind for a year, you know? Yeah. I mean, you just got to put that out there and say, well, there's a lot of stuff that that's not going to matter for, but you're not going to be doing a whole lot of iron cross work. You're not going to be doing too much dipping. Uh, some plant stuff might still be fine, uh, but it may not be as much as you want so on and so forth. Front lever won't be affected at all. Um, You'll have a beast front lever, dude. Yeah, so it's just about picking your goals and tailoring uh, where you put some of that volume. Um, so th I think that as long as you have realistic expectations, uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the program is designed to get the most out of your body. It doesn't really matter uh, whether you're injured or not, as long as you have body parts that you can train. So, I mean, if you're in a body cast, then you should probably wait. But if you're just, I'm just saying, <laughs> why would you say that? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, but if, for example, I, I have a, I have an injury in Matera's major right now, meaning yeah. I, I can't do lap pull downs or front lever work or anything that requires that muscle. <laughs> So I just do anything else, you know, I do um, my planche stuff, I do my bench press, I do my uh, triceps, biceps, delts, whatever, whatever mm -hmm. I can do, I'll make those muscles big, you know, I have to stop. Yeah, yeah, yeah and, so and then for, the, and for rehab, I just do light stuff, extremely light stuff. I'm talking about lap pull downs for 200 reps, dude, <laughs> like, because that's the only, so I, I pick a weight that doesn't hurt and then I do that for a bunch of reps and then. I try to do that as spread throughout the day and, you know, massage that beast and keep, keep, you know, you just gotta, you just gotta do rehab. That's what's up. All right. Up to the next question by Lucas Sampio. Sampeo. Uh, I'm interested in starting a plant-based diet, but is taking meat out of the equation worse for my gains? I understand that I would likely need to eat 20% more protein or so, but there are but are there any other recommendations for plant-based athletes? Yeah, you need to have a good B complex. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, particularly B8 or B12. Um folate you can get from some vegetables, but um B12 you can't. It's a um 
it's a gut fermentation product basically so you need to have a b12 supplement there are a few others i mean in general if you have a good multivitamin you have a yeah. b12 supplement and uh because like your folate's going to come from a lot of leafy greens and stuff um and the problem is that that can mask a B12 deficiency in labs for years until you have irreparable uh, nerve damage. But oh, dude! <clears throat> oh, dude! Listen, there's there are people who and they'll temporarily feel better with just a big folate supplement, and then just things will keep getting worse. And by the time they start getting worse again, it's like that's permanent. Your myelin is gone, so you can't really fix the um, can't really fix the damage. So you just make sure when you're when you're totally and also like plant based doesn't mean meat free, right? Plant based just means that a lot of what you're getting, probably more than 50 percent is plants. Now, if you're being a strict non meat vegetarian. You got to be very good about your uh, supplementation again, good multivitamin and a uh, B12 supplement are your two biggest ones. And then, um, like you said, 20% more protein-ish. And uh, that's about it. And also different sources of protein, right? Yeah, that gets more complex. Essential amino acids. Um, that's a, that's a, it's like you need to mix your rices and your beans. You need to mix your, yeah. uh, you know, there's, there are food groups you're going to have to do some self-education on that. People get a little bit too silly with it sometimes. but um, you, can, you can get away. And he'd probably if be you are then. well, if if you're eating a combination of beans and other starch sources, and then you are eating like a combination of leaves nuts. and seeds, nuts, um, roots, stems, fruits, then uh, fruits meaning that the flesh that grows around seeds, um, you know, these when you get when you're eating all the different plant parts and you're eating different plant families, you're going to have a very hard time uh, going far wrong, you know? Yeah. So it takes more effort. I mean, there's no question about it. It does can take he, more effort. Can he also just take whey and be good with it? If he wants, if he's not ethically or whatever um, opposed yeah, 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 to it. I mean, it's an animal can... product. True. So, you know, it depends on how you feel about it and why he's you're not doing vegan. it. Well, I mean, if he'd be vegan, then yeah. But, uh, you yeah. know, whatever whatever works for you, dude. Yeah, that's the thing. Like, I'm less concerned about stuff like that and just, um, you know, you make your choices. If you don't want to do whey, do soy. If you don't want to do soy, do hemp. If you don't want to do hemp, I don't care. Do something. Um, you're going to need to have some kind of a uh, protein supplement from a practical perspective because trying to get... Like a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of protein from whole food plant sources is extremely what difficult. What about pea protein? I just I found that on my protein. Pea protein is good. I don't like the texture personally. I've had a lot of different sources yeah, of pea protein. Yeah, but it's a lot protein. cheaper than, than all the other protein. Yeah, but it's chalk. <laughs> Dude, <laughs> the last thing I care about is taste. I take flavorless protein. I've yeah, been taking you don't, that three you, times you a not, day. You do not know <laughs> the level of chalky, and you don't know <laughs> the kind of farts that are going to come at you in the middle of the night. You're oh, going to jump out. You're going to wake up in the air having jumped out of your window in your sleep. That's how bad the farts are going to be. With pea um, protein, it's that bad? Look at the fiber content. Okay, well, how high is it? It's pretty high. Ingredients. Putting, uh, I'm pretty sure. See. Uh, this is garbage. Doesn't they don't show it? Whatever. I trust you. I they trust may have you. a different source now, but no. I mean, like, I don't really know exactly what it was and all. It gets extremely thick <laughs> when you mix it, which makes the chalkiness even worse. <laughs> um, and there's no getting. There's no making it better. Um. I'm not trying to rag on pea protein, even though no, I'm no, no, obviously no, 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 no. ragging on it. But um, I've been there. I've done that. I've tried a, a bunch you of know? different ones. <laughs> and if you like it, man, get in it. But yeah, it's cheap. Yeah, <laughs> that's the only thing I have to say. It's cheap, and then I stop. I don't have any other pros. <laughs> yeah. No, you know what Leo did the other day? I don't. I he took whey and he mixed it with his rice. Okay. He kicked. Oh, he like cooked. the powder. Yeah, he cooked 
he put it to he cooked rice with whey. So we oh hang on. So <laughs> what? what? So he like took you... so he took rice like dry rice and then yeah, he and took then water he, he, and he mixed yeah, water and, and protein. Yes. So he cooked his rice in a protein shake. Yes. <laughs> That's awesome. Was it terrible? No, he said it was super doable. Huh. Well, there you go. Yeah, I would I not have like, thought of that. I was like, it sounded That's disgusting hilarious. to me. He said it's a little bit sticky, but he said it's totally doable, and he's doing it now. It's his thing. So, hey, man, whatever. you know what? Yeah, <laughs> that's a great thing about a lot of this stuff is you can you really can do what you want. And I've got no room to talk, man. My senior residents tell like hilarious stories about my uh, eating habits. All I know is I gave him some protein, whey protein, because he was asking for it. And mm-hmm. It was by the one of our trainees, and then uh, he said, "Wait, dude, do." You- the amount of things you can do. You can make rice, rice protein. I said, you shouldn't do that. One day later, he did it. He said, it's great. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay. Interesting. <laughs> he doesn't fantastic. care. He just goes for it. Good for him. Yeah. All right, let's move I'm, on to the next question. <laughs> dude, this one is, uh, protein yeah. brownies. Yeah, but th- those are good. I, I made they some of those. They're great. I-, I love that. But I just couldn't, I'm very picky about my rice. You know that. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. I, it's, it's a ten, it's ten, ten step process for me. I prepare them twelve hours hours beforehand. I'll I, tell you why I wouldn't do it. Um, <laughs> I would forget it, and then I get in enough trouble with uh, uh, with Morgan when I uh, forget rice in the rice cooker for two weeks. Could you imagine protein rice forgotten in the <laughs> rice cooker for two weeks? Jesus. Yeah, I'd be out of the home. Yeah, you'd be done. I'd be sleeping in like with the horses. <laughs> You be gym, you be sleeping in the gym. That's true. It's air conditioned now. You have an air conditioner. You can sleep in the gym on one of the benches. <laughs> no, <it's... laughs> anyway, next question by Mauro Gomez Oferis. He says, "What is Labco Fitness' current position respect to metabolic stress or muscle growth?" Oh, he's talking about metabolite theory. It's not very strong. Um, I don't know what this, I'll be honest. I don't know. I know what he's asking. What he's. Sorry, I'm eating a taco. Um, it's fine. It's pretty good. It's got fried shrimp in it. Um, oh, it came, it came from the movie dude. theater. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Proceed. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, I'm, I'm hoping it's okay for me to be eating these. Anyways. Well, since when do you care about that? I don't, I just don't want to be in trouble because I ate Morgan's leftovers, but I think that, um, mm. I mean, they they are, they're, they're her leftovers, but I, I think I was told it was okay. If okay. not, I might have a few new scars. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so what he's asking is basically, what is our position on the importance of building up metabolites for muscle growth? Okay. And there are position papers out there. There are meta-analyses. There's an enormous amount of information. And the number one input for muscle growth is mechanical stress. Um, so automatically, that, that'll that tell you one thing. Uh, we go by data. And we also go by uh, what we see. And it is way easier to get bigger when you are using uh, a heavy enough weight. The, and, and, and the funny thing is that, you know, people have this mistaken impression of what causes more metabolic stress. When you, when you use like 80% of your one rep max to failure, mm-hmm. and you use 30% of your one rep max to failure, you're actually, believe it or not, you have higher lactate, you have higher intracellular uh, metabolic byproducts. In other words, you have more metabolites after the 80% set. And people don't understand that. And you actually also have higher metabolites if you give yourself four or five minute rest periods. And then if you try and do everything like 30 seconds, 30 seconds, 30 seconds, which goes against a lot of what a lot of us, including myself, believed probably eight, 10 years ago. Uh, But we have the evidence now. We have it straight from the muscle biopsies after uh, working sets and blood tests and all this stuff. And it's very conclusive. And it also kind of bears out with a lot of what people have found in their own training. 
uh, especially when they eat enough, is that it is a lot easier to grow bigger if you give yourself enough rest time to properly recover from one set to the next because you get more high quality work done with a heavier weight. And now you've taken both the volume aspect of growth, which is that you need to have more exposure over a given period of time, like a week, than you did the week before. And then we also know that, yes, intensity does have an effect. It's just not the biggest effect. Cumulative volume is number one. Intensity is the second thing. And obviously, none of those matter if you're not eating enough. And then, yes. um, yeah, and the funny thing is that, sure, you could make arguments that, oh, well, the metabolic stuff is important, but it's not what people think it is. People think it means, geez, should I be using like 60% for like 30 reps or something? Will I, is that, is that where my metabolites come from? And it turns out like, not really. Um, it's not that it doesn't do it, but you notice the people who do that typically are not running around as big and strong as the people who are, uh, lifting in that like 70, 80, 85% range. Yeah. And, um, you know, just is what it is. Evidence is out there to support from a scientific perspective and just watching people over the course of a training year when they take those two approaches, the vast majority of people do much better with the slightly higher intensity approach with the more moderate volume and longer rest periods, you know? So, uh, but they'll both grow well if they eat enough. Okay. Yeah, so it's just that it's not, it's not a big, as big of a deal. Um, you know, if it's one of those things that concerns you, you do your heavy workout, and then 45 seconds after the end of your last set, you do a burnout with a lighter weight. And exactly, specifics yeah. on that, we share inside the lab. All right. With that note, let's move on to the next one. Uh, to Cody Clark, uh, are there any sh extra strength gains from doing freestanding handsome push-ups instead, uh, instead of focusing on wall handsome push-ups? Could I see similar strength gains by working up to weighted handsome push-ups instead of working up to 90 degrees push-ups? So there are two questions here. What? Uh, so Those the first question. Two different directions. Yeah, yeah. So the first question was basically freestanding handsome push up versus wall handsome push up. And so you would have to think what is the purpose of the exercise? In what context are you doing them? If your, if your wall handstand push ups are using the same form as your freestanding handstand push ups, which, believe it or not, can be done, yeah. Olaf actually shows a very smart way to do it. Um, yeah, I've never like that's. I'm still like boom. <laughs> like I never you... did that. Yeah, no, it's it's yeah. pretty smart. Um, I mean, it's how if he is asking me how would I do this, that's what would come out of my mouth. But it's not something I would have come up with unless I was prompted. So yeah, it was very creative. It's very smart. Uh, I think that um, I, I think that a lot of people will find a lot of use out of that because it'll make them comfortable. Um, but but back then, to the point: Are there any extra strength gains? Strength gains from freestanding versus wall well again if your form is nearly identical and the range of motion is nearly identical then no not really um the difference will be that the uh the freestanding handstand push-ups will continue to enhance your balance mm -hmm. um but you kind of need your balance in the first place to do them so i don't I yeah, don't know that that's the, <laughs> it's it's weird. The question is more like, what are we talking? What what strength toward? Yeah, what? I mean, wrist strength, sure, maybe a little bit. Yeah, but not that's a lot. Not, but I think uh, what he's actually trying and to say is not the is, right way to go about it. Yeah, no, but I think he's what he's actually trying to say is what's more practical. And then I would I think say it depends wall. on whether you have a wall. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> what do you have a wall? Yeah, no, I would I so, would probably do a wall and, unless you have very good balance and you're like, fuck it, and you can yeah. do freestanding. Then yeah, yeah do and, freestanding. unless you are able to go, and, and this is a very small group of people, if you're able to go to muscular failure in a That's freestanding really handstand, like your form doesn't fail, your balance doesn't fail, you're just That's unable to so push hard. up again. Um, and... You're unable to do the same amount. Like you should, th then maybe there would be uh, no real advantage to in it from a strength perspective, not from a skill perspective. From a strength perspective, there yeah. would no longer be an advantage to being on the wall. But the wall is typically going to let you get more volume, and it's going to allow you to be 
very consistent with your form early on, which is a big mm -hmm. part of transitioning off the wall. And um, so, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a very nice place to work. It just depends on whether it sits well with you. But objectively, yeah, it, yeah the, wall, the wall's going to do a great job. The, the freestanding is much more variable. Yeah, and his second, squ his second question was more based on weighted handset push-ups versus 90 degrees push-ups. And they're totally different exercises. Yeah. It, the 90 it's degrees just question. contains a handset, a, a, a push-up, handset push-up element. Right. Basically. Uh, right. But I would, if I had to choose which one to do for basic strength, then mm -hmm. weighted handset push-up all the way. Yeah, I agree. Uh, it's I agree. just... The 90-degree push-up is a combination of being able to do a planche push-up and also being able to do yeah. a good freestanding push-up. I, mean, you know I, I mean, would always put it in skill. I would never use it as a basic strength exercise. Yeah, I think Unless... that when you get further enough along, you can do some stuff like that, but um, it's still not the best use of your time. It's, yeah, it's not it, practical. It really is more it's... skill than basic strength. Yeah. And it's very good skill. Like mm -hmm. it's, I, I actually I fix a lot of shoulder issues by practicing ninety degrees push-ups. Yeah, so yeah, it, it's it, like it definitely to me it would has be an its accessory. place. It's it, not. To me, it it's would not be a, an accessory. Yeah, it's not a show-off move. Like oh, a lot of people are like, oh, it's only show-off. No, it's it's all it it has actual practical. You know, it's actually practical. It's a it very does, good. But it, you took the time to learn a good. You you, you learned good hand or uh, you learned good handstand push-ups. Mm -hmm. And you also learned very good um, planche push-ups. Push and so, and, and then we, we, we worked on how to chain them together through yeah. the transition because that transition is not what people think it is typically. And once you figured that out, what it really did is it actually allowed you to practice both of those things. And especially, I think it would enhance your handstand push-ups because... That's really more of the direction they're, that it goes in. They're actually now now much easier than a few months ago. I because I I I am um, doing much more uh, chest work than I usually mm -hmm. did because my chest was kind of lagging behind. So I upped that. Mm -hmm. And for some reason now, so what I used to do during ninety degrees push ups is I would try to force my elbows outwards. So mm -hmm. I would do that because I, would, I was able to hold a certain body position, like a hollow body that I could easily press back up. And if mm -hmm. I would, if I didn't do that, I would arch and I couldn't get back. But mm -hmm. now, I can get back whenever I want. It's so easy. So I can comfortably get in a bent arm planche position. I can rest there and I can push back up. Whereas in the past, it was a pretty difficult position to be in because I was forcing myself on the hollow body. I was like, Arr! but now it's like, oh, I'm just chilling. I'm going back and forth. Just, just a side note. I'm really happy with that. It's, yeah, it's I just, mean that's the <laughs> that's it's, like it's people less, don't understand. Like, yeah, you know. it's. Just, it was, just train your chest for a couple of months. It's, it's okay it's so to weird. say, geez, I don't really want to be a bodybuilder. And then <laughs> say, geez, you know, actually, it's kind of, I kind of like how my shirt sits on my chest now. <laughs> and then you go do a few things and you're like, that got easier. How about that? It's much easier. It's so weird. I, I don't have to force anything. I'm just going to a man on plant and I'm pressing back up. That's all there is. Yeah. I don't have to overthink it. It's so it's, it, I did four reps, by the way, the other day. Which is my my PR, and I think I can five. I can get five in a few weeks if I want. I'm not even a strict skill cycle. I'm, I'm doing say, mass. You're not even doing this, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm in a mass cycle. I, like I'm not even supposed nice. to be. <laughs> that's cool, right? Well, that means you're stronger than that, yeah. Yeah, that's so cool. Anyway, moving on to the next question by Robert Burchell, and he asks, "Okay, he asks, is power building a thing? What are your thoughts on it? And is it something that can be done?" with bodyweight training using skills and such what does he mean with power building oh he means um bodybuilding with heavy weights of course it's a thing it's just weight lifting with the heavier weight so um, like strength like a strength cycle basically uh, it's I... more like uh it would be more similar to the lower end rep range of mass cycle too um oh okay. the yeah that kind of thing um so yes it is a thing it's not better or worse. Not everybody responds uh, as well to that as others. It wears on people's joints sometimes. Um, power building is really just using uh, the the powerlifting movements for bodybuilding. So, ah, okay. and 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 lifting very heavy. Um, it's not it's not a good way to preserve your body. Uh, it's fun to do for a while. So, like for a strength cycle, 
um, or for a uh, higher intensity, lower rep range uh, mass cycle, then sure, um, that's, that is basically what you're doing. And we incorporate that in the appropriate places. Yeah, but we don't stay there too long because uh, it's just too much of an injury risk. Okay. Yeah, I and mean, it's just, it, you know, there's, <clears throat> it's not like there's an additional benefit. It's just some people like it more. If they like it more, I say go for it uh, with the understanding that you should probably still cycle out of it sometimes, give your body yeah. a rest. All right, moving on to the next question by Roy Basil. He always mm-hmm. asks in every podcast we have answered one question. Roy's always here guy. for us. <laughs> He's always here. <laughs> what do you have today? Curious about your thoughts on rope climbing. Any advantages over regular pulling work with the bar? And what are the risks versus rewards? Mm. Rope climbing. It's, is it? Oh. Okay, let's, let's look at it. Rope climbing, so, is, it, is it practical? Can you scale it? Stuff like that. Like, uh, are, you, are we measuring? Are, are we, yeah, you could do that. Are you measuring, instead of reps, the, the amount of meters? <laughs> like, what's going on? Like, I, I, never, I never did rope climbing for actual training. I just did it for fun every now and then. Uh, I think so, you can do it. But isn't there, isn't there like, a, a risk factor for your forearms and your elbow flexors? Forearms, wrists, and shoulders, just because of the position that you stay in, uh, and it depends on what you're doing. The way that I get around most of that, so I actually, when I train wrestlers, one of the things that I always have them do is rope pull-ups, but they have two ropes. So they are literally, it's like uh, it's like being on a bar, but you're on a rope. Yeah, and yeah, So yeah. they don't have their hands together in the center of their chest, because that creates some issues there are other things that we'll do that are similar to that but um it is a good grip builder the problem is that ropes are twisted only in one direction you can't get a a clockwise rope and a counterclockwise rope so it's going to fit real good in one hand and real a lot less well in the other whoa i would what i would have never thought about that yeah i found that out the hard way um a long time (laughs) ago and I had some wrist impingement that took almost a year to really get better. Um, I also was kind of overdoing things a little. Uh, so it was a combination of stupidity and not recognizing why certain fingers were working more on one hand than the other. Because there's yeah, no yeah. neurological problem. But it was like, it's just how things slid and fit in the rope. Because, yeah. it's That's As soon as you grab the rope and you start pulling it with just one hand, you start seeing, oh, okay. Well, it's not really quite the same. Um so I had some interesting solutions for that. Uh, they and, and now they sell a number of different things. Uh, one of the easiest things to do is to either wear a rubber glove and use a um, uh, nylon rope because they tend they they make these nylon ropes that have no twist. They're a braid. It's like a giant climbing rope. Uh, like a like you know how the rock climbing ropes are round. They're not. Um, they're, it's not like a Manila rope where you have several smaller ropes that are twisted together. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's just a bunch of fibers inside of a sheath, basically. And that works a lot better. Um, but they're slippery, so you have to use either... If you're doing barehanded, you've got to use a rosin. Um, chalk's really not good enough. Because you'll come to a point where you slip, and once you slip, the, the friction coefficient's so low that um, you're, you're just going to burn the skin off your hand before you ever catch your grip again. So you really need to use some grip aids um, when you're using that kind of a rope. Uh, especially if you're climbing on it so that's well that's why people like natural fiber ropes they feel better they're harder to slip on because they have higher friction and and yet you'll have these same people who say well i like this rope because my hand sticks to it better but then you say okay why don't you just wear a sticky glove on that rope well that's cheating are you fucking kidding me (laughs) they both create friction what are you doing (laughs) grab the rope wear the glove my god like it's the, the way that things get reasoned now it drives me bananas sometimes. So we to get to the point, though, we do, we do. Um, but to, I would not do most of your volume with ropes. Um, I do like them. I think that they're fun. I think that they're pretty easy. I don't think that they are in any way a um, necessary component and i don't think that they have any super inherent advantages if you are not going into a rope climbing competition if you are going into a rope climbing competition then yes they have advantages because they're specific to your sport but 
outside of that, no, not really. I, I think that they're just a thing that's fun to do. And um, I would much rather use two ropes than one. It's going to be a lot easier on you. I'm thinking of doing one of those competitions. Because yeah, uh, I mean, I, to, when I was you, young... I, would, I mean, we'll talk about it, but I mean, I'll, I'll, there, there's a totally different way to approach the way that... Uh, yeah, but you know, you know, that. I tried it the other day. You know how fast I can climb? Yeah, I bet you fucking fly. I fly. <laughs> I, I remember when I was like seven and we were we were in the gym during our first rope climb and i was the mm -hmm. only one doing it without using my legs i was like this young kid climbing so fast i was like oh this is fun mm -hmm. and the teachers were like dude this guy's fast <laughs> and then now and then when i was 16 i did it in front lever i tried to i got halfway mm -hmm. and and then uh a few weeks ago i a few months ago i tried it in the bowler gym and i got up like what was i think a five meter rope within 3.6 seconds something like that Wow. So it was bad. something like that. It was really fast. And then I was like, oh man, if I train for this. Mm hmm Because I, I I'm just really I'm I'm really uh gifted bullying wise. Yep. Just That's, uh Yeah, you yeah. are. <clears throat> just Well it's like you, you gotta be careful with it too, you know. I mean you've had enough volume now to where, you know, you'll you'll be okay, yeah. but still your your hand forearm stuff is not up to speed with your back. And so the training, like you would be more of a person that I would say, well, we're gonna we're we're just gonna focus on the skill. You're not you're still gonna do most of your training volume with normal stuff because I, Yeah, I don't think you need much specific hurt stuff for that. Yeah. But I don't think you need to. Uh, mm -mm. I think just doing my regular pull up work is uh should be should be good enough. To be yeah, honest. it is. Um I've maybe also a power, maybe a power building cycle, a power yeah. cycle. Yeah, we no, just stick to okay. the training stuff that we have. Yeah, yeah. okay. <laughs> it's easy. It's easy you to know, be good at stuff. You just have to be patient and train hard, and sometimes be born special. <laughs> yeah, I'll be honest. I got really lucky with that. I don't yeah. know if it's like I have a weird lat insertion thing going on. Like I don't know I why. I think so. Because I don't have big lats. Just, They're not that big. No, you just have a different... You, you have different physics. I mean, it's the same laws, but you have different attachment points. But I do have very long arms. Yeah, but that doesn't... Uh, it's not that an inherent advantage. I know, that's not... That's like a disadvantage, right? Yeah, kind of. I mean, it depends on where they're long. Forearms, it's not going to matter. Um, it'll see. put you at a disadvantage for a competition bench. Uh, but when your upper arms are shorter, it actually oh, is Oh, my upper better. arms are shorter, dude. Well... That's better oh. for pulls. And I got long hands. Yeah, because yeah. it, re it reduces the disadvantage of the class three lever. And then... Um, what about planche? That's harder because your arm's kind of in a unit. Um, yeah. It fuck. depends on how you want to look at it. Uh, I don't think that it's worth delving into too much because it's not a barrier. Nah. No, well, let's move on to the next question. This is the last question, by the way. It's uh, one by Ansi Liebach. And mm -hmm. uh, actually, uh, I had a consult with him two days ago about mm -hmm. this question, and we he would he said he would ask this in the podcast. And okay, very interested. I'm very interested in your take on this. So he linked two, um, two studies. I'll send them right now, and I'll read the question. <clears throat> would you please okay. share your opinion on these studies done on elderly men where vitamin C and E supplementation is shown to reduce the effects of strength training. Oh, yeah, because it's an anti-inflammatory effect. It's too much. Um, what, so dude? I take a lot of C, so I haven't opened. I haven't opened them yet, but we already know how these work. Um, this is not a... This is normal. So this is the same... This is going to be the same mechanism by which uh, superdosing um, your antioxidants actually makes you more vulnerable to uh, disease which uh -huh. a lot of people don't seem to realize. But it's totally true. So let's see what their dosing was. They were doing... 500 uh, milligrams of C and 170.5. The vitamin E is probably more the issue that's kind of a high vitamin E dose. Um, yeah, because I take around thousands. But let's, let's see what this was. Hang on. Let's see. Let me use my magic to view the full text. <laughs> oh, we know what you're doing. No, you don't. Yeah, no, I just this. Do. I'd probably do. I won't mention it because it's, uh, <laughs> you know. 
Let's see. Yeah, because I take 1,000 milligrams, man. A day. Of C. I don't take uh, it's, extra. It's, so, so here's the thing. They are stacking these antioxidants immediately before and immediately after training. So they're they're taking two doses. So it's it's a gram of vitamin C basically within an hour. Mm -hmm. And it is directly surrounding training. And that, you know, that that area around training, you need inflammation in order to grow. So okay. Part of the issue here is that they are they're they're going to be decreasing the inflammatory response to exercise, and that's really unfortunate. Can um, I ask a question? However, something that calls things into question here, uh, and this is where I, I need to see what their protocol was, okay. because sometimes their protocols are so shitty that um, <laughs> it's not worth using any of the data seriously. And we'll t we'll look at it in a second. Um, Sure. So the size gain was an issue. They didn't gain as much, but we're also not talking about a whole lot of uh of what we're yeah, I don't know. We're talking about a couple percentage. They I mean that's within measurement error potentially. Um and then they also say increase of lean mass in trunk and arms. And elbow flexors did not shift between groups, which makes me think that the study is kind of garbage. Um, you should not be getting substantially different results between legs and arms for something like this. That that calls a lot of things into question. Uh -huh. But um, if you're going to have... Sorry, I have to do this CAPTCHA shit. Sure, you think. Oh, I forgot to... It's an interesting question because I take uh, collagen after workout with vitamin C. So I'm just, yeah, but you have a, you should have a relatively low dose. Um, Three hundred thirty-three milligrams. Yeah. Of C. Yeah, and it's only once. You're also yeah, doing I, morning. A, I afternoon, can guarantee evening. you're doing a lot more volume than these people are. So <clears throat> they're elderly men. Let's see. I also don't like. I, I don't think that there's much to it. Uh, looking at the set of uh, results that they have, but like mechanistically, you would be reducing the free radical response to exercise, which is a thing. Um, mm -hmm. So let's look at their strength training program. Uh. I'm just going to keep don't the people have entertained. <laughs> so the protocol included three full body sessions per week. Yeah. Um, emphasizing free weight exercises for all the major muscle groups, blah, blah. So two of the sessions each week were moderate, eight to 10 reps, with one uh, rest between set, and one varied between heavy and light um, every second, yeah, every other week. The train, strength training program is thoroughly explained by Paulson et al. So I'll have to look at that. It really pisses me off when people do that. It's a barrier to immediately knowing what the hell they did. And in my opinion, that is typically one of your first things uh, you show. It's it's yeah, that's not that's not a good uh, not a good sign. Number of sets. Increasing, blah blah blah. The last set was formed with the failure. Blah. Let's see. They don't even talk about what exercise selections they are looking at. Well, you mean what exercises? Let's see. They did the one. They're I mean. literally doing okay. So they're doing leg extensions, bicep, bicep curls, curls, and leg press. And leg press. That's interesting. Um, 
so we don't know there there's a lot of there's a lot of unknown a lot of unknown stuff here there was also a notable difference in calories which is kind of interesting uh and very important and of the course. uh antioxidant group was eating more calories the total vitamin c per day supposedly uh, i don't i'm not a fan of how they're uh putting this together how did they measure muscle thickness a lot of times that's ultrasound yeah Ultra, yeah, MRI is much more accurate. Um, <clears throat> ultrasound is heavily dependent on the uh, skill of the um, of the person who does it. Technician. One person did all the measurements, which is good. So. One of the things that you'll notice in a lot of research, uh, and were these people? <laughs> okay, inclusion criteria could not have done strength training within when six months. So they had to be essentially already primed for, so this is not a good group to study this in. in yeah, yeah, opinion. yeah. Um, so it's, yeah, th this is, this is essentially, and this, these are the only a, two studies done on this. a young novice study. Yeah. Um, one test was excluded from one rep maximum, which was a leg extension because, oh, okay. That was, that was just uh one person. Um, so that's fine. I mean, I think the analysis stuff was probably done as well as it could be within uh, everything that they looked at. I think that there's probably some issues when you have the... Uh, so they the, the problem here is that they... When you look at what they measured, uh, they measured... They were doing this by rectus femoris, and let's see. But there's a lot of crossover between these groups, so you can't even... Yeah, this is... <laughs> yeah. In order, yeah, that's... So there's a, there, there is a trend, and I would believe, I would believe that, um... Just more research to be done, basically. In, in general, the trend is that in all areas, the antioxidant group was not uh, did not get quite the as good results. And okay, I think that um, That would probably be borne out. That's what, if I was going to expect to see a group not get the results, it would be the antioxidant group that would be uh, a little bit limited. Well, how much we're we talking about? Oh, uh, not much. Um, so nothing we should be worrying about. This probably. is not a group. This is this is a completely non-representative group. This is not yeah. who our trainees are, and if our train. But I will say that. Uh, I would not recommend that people, you know, take a freaking gram of vitamin C right before or after their workout. That's stupid. Um, it's too much for one thing. And the reason they split it most likely is just for absorption purposes. But then that vitamin E dose is massive. I mean, you know, they're getting 250 international units you don't want that like even 40 is enough to put you at increased risk of prostate cancer oh shit. um and and this one is like this dose is getting oh wait 117 milligrams we we this hold on i need to do an international i 
made the mistake of uh, assuming they were using reasonable units. Yeah, yeah, let's, yeah. Let's see what this is. 117.5 milligrams to international unit. How much? I don't know. What Bert? Oh, yeah, because there's there's a Jesus Christ. Ah, oh, they don't defend. We'll just <laughs> we'll use the most common form of vitamin E from milligram to international units converting one one seventeen five research is exciting guys okay So it depends on what they're using, but it's between two hundred and it's between like two hundred and fifty and uh, three hundred and fifty international units. Which is a that lot. That is that is that is over ten times the upper recommended limit. Um, so that falls into the category of mega dosing, and vitamin E is so vitamin c recharges vitamin e that's kind of the long and the short of what it does in the very small realm of antioxidant function um the let's see let me make sure i'm not saying that backwards it's been so many years so yeah, exactly. Vitamin C basically uh, is a reducing agent for vitamin E so that it can then perform its uh, antioxidant function again. So you're doing two things. You're, you, what you're doing is you're dramatically enhancing vitamin E activity. Um, that's not great. I would not ever recommend somebody do that protocol, uh, not just because the studies show that it didn't help anybody and led to a trend to decreased results, but more importantly, guys, it's going to put you at risk of prostate cancer and everybody else. High doses of vitamin E, once you get up, like if, if you did that, I mean, you're, there's going to be a fair number of people who are going to develop uh, bleeding disorders. So, um, so you, and you can read about this. I don't know if you guys talked about this in uh, the first three years of med school, but high doses I don't of vitamin you remember you ever hear you remember hearing anything about uh vitamin E and um basically uh preventing um clotting factor synthesis? Uh yeah, I think so. Let's it's see. been a, it's been a while. I don't know how you remember everything, dude. I don't know either. It just happens. <laughs> um it just happens. Yeah, <laughs> so so here's the problem. Like once you get up over a certain amount, uh you, <laughs> you you inhibit the synthesis of all of your clotting factors, which is bad. Yeah, it so, is So, you know, there's... You got to know this stuff, and most people don't. Um, so they don't know why certain things are dangerous. Um, you know, that's... That's... Uh, so what you gotta, you gotta realize like that 22 international units is the uh is going to take care of about 98 percent of living people's needs um okay. in other words there there are going to be some people who will either need a lot less than that or a lot more but the a lot amount i mean the standard deviation for that i'm not quite sure what it is but it's going to be pretty small it'll be like some people might need 30 um you know what I mean? Like that would bump them yeah, up a yeah. couple standard deviations. So we are not talking about a huge amount. And having having that kind of a vitamin E intake would put you at risk of increased cancer. It would put you at risk of bleeding. It would put you at a lot of a lot of issues. Um, it would cause problems with um, 
killing cells that need to be killed because antioxidant or oxidative processes are how we kill things. Um, yeah. So well, I th let's wrap it up. It's man. not a good deal. Yeah. Let's, let's wrap it up. Let's spend way too much time on his last, uh, no, question. Can, yeah. I mean, you can edit that up if you want, but, um, we'll probably won't. <laughs> yeah, it's fine. These people things are raw. I wonder if people are still listening. I don't know. I hope not. <laughs> most of them are like, oh, just been rambling too long. <laughs> oh, well. Yeah, it's the same. They just did the same thing. Well, Ansi, I hope you're happy with they, your answer. They used the same. I, I think that they used the same, um, the same group and then just took different measurements, published. They basically did a bunch of stuff and then published it. Um, well, no, this is a different group, but they basically had similar trends in the sense that um, it's not a good thing and it might be a bad thing. So don't, the, the takeaway here is don't mega dose your uh, antioxidants. Take normal person amounts. Okay. Okay. I can do yeah. that. I can do yeah. that. Like, All right. <laughs> it's just, oh, what are people doing? <laughs> Well, guys, to wrap yeah. it up, this was a lab remember, don't fitness. be worried. Don't be worried about the vitamin C by itself. Yeah, it's the combination that's going to be a problem. But you, you know, like you, you only need if you're doing a research protocol, you only need like uh, 250 ish milligrams with the collagen. So, you know, we're not talking about anything crazy here. And you typically cool. take that an hour before exercise. So by the time you're doing stuff. You know, it's already in circulation. You're not going to be, uh, I don't know, you, it's, I just don't think it's going to be the same kind of uh, thing at all. Okay, man, let's wrap it up. That's enough. <laughs> okay. Yeah? Yeah. Okay, Sorry, cool. you know me, I can, I can get lost in that shit. Jo Josh we'll, gets we'll lost. He really, you, can, you can see he's like shaking back and forth like, he wants, he wants to know it all. <laughs> well, this is how I learn stuff, you know, is you, yeah, you have to I get see. into the reference. You have to go in and you say, okay, how do they do this? What was their protocol? They referenced this. What did that mean? Was that even a good reference? Um, and so it takes a lot of time. To, yeah, it does. That was a very incomplete. I mean, it would take hours to go through and make sure that that study is genuinely worth paying attention to if you were a elderly male. Yeah. So for our group, youngsters, nobody should be paying attention to that. But the, the underlying thing about don't mega dose that you should be paying attention to. Yeah. Well, guys, that was a Lapco Fitness podcast. I think we're done answering the questions. We answered all of them. Um, and that's it, Josh. You want to say bye to everyone? Hey, thanks for sticking with us through that. And... Um, I don't know. It's always a pleasure. It's always great to get your questions. Keep sending them in. Always look yeah. forward to answering them. And um, you get excited and decide to upgrade or tell other people about the place and they end up in the lab. We'll end up loving to see them there. So we really appreciate having you guys. Keep asking the questions. We'll see you next time. See you next time, guys. Later. <laughs>